Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Dead Cool Show, where we spend about two hours looking at and listening to people who died at some point in history this week. This is Ronan Leonard and we start this week's show with Perez Prado and Mambo number 5. in a bottle. So we started there with uh, Perez Prado. He died on the 14th of September 1989 at the 
age of 72. People of my uh, vintage uh, who grew up in Ireland in the 90s probably had the hankering for a pint of a pint of playing there because obviously that music was used in one of the most beloved uh, Guinness ads uh, and particularly people who are uh, grew up with two channels um, RT and RT2 there was there was a lot lower bar to be a TV star so there was a uh, one of the best DJs in Ireland used to be the host of a TV show called No Disco Donald Deneen and I remember I'm not going to call it an urban myth I'm going to call it a very specific Bishopstown schoolyard based myth that he was actually oh no he's the dancer in the ad and it was very hard to check that out um, but it, it was definitely not him. Uh, other people might know that song, or well, sorry, more more specifically, Perez Prado himself. He'd be known as the King of the Mambo. But in On the Road, the Jack Kerouac novel, uh, he his music is mentioned, um, and they're they're dancing to it and stuff like that. Um, he 1950s onwards was his heyday. Uh, he was bringing. A lot of Cuban music across the world when perhaps Cuba had uh, a different uh, narrative going on. And we followed that then with, uh, as I said, Jim Croce, who died at a much younger age of just 30 uh, on the 20th of September 1973. I read, um, I'm very conscious I'm not just here to give you um, bite-sized biographies of everybody. So if you like them, just go. Look into him yourself, uh, like a taxi driver um, with a conspiracy theory. Do your own research. But one thing I read was, so Jim and his wife had a very loving, uh, like long-term relationship, obviously. And he had a love-hate relationship with being, chasing the the musical dream. So he, he stopped a good few times and he went back on the road and worked with people and then stepped back. And so he, he he died in a plane crash just before a tour ended that he was on. It was called the Life and Times Tour, uh, ironically, I suppose. But after he passed away, a letter arrived to his wife, Ingrid, saying that he had decided he was quitting music and he was just going to write um, stories and movie scripts and stuff like that and withdraw from public life, which uh, is incredibly bittersweet because, you know... In his death, he got more of a public um, notoriety. And I did read that in his his first album, which he released in 1966, uh, there was only 500 copies made, and it cost $500 to make, which is about nearly $5,000 now. And it was actually a wedding gift from his parents, who said that he had to spend that money on the album, but it was with the intention that he would become so disillusioned with not making money that he would actually stop pursuing the career. And with that in mind, I have a Patreon. Uh, If you look up forward slash TBRL, that's where you can find me. And I have a sub stack as well. They are very underpopulated at the moment, but I have to start telling people, otherwise I'll never start. And I... I do appreciate the feedback I've been getting over the last few weeks with the episodes as they're going. This is the strongest one yet. I feel, I think I've really got the the skeleton or the spine, the template of the show now. And I'd love to hear from you, not just praise, but any errors, any clarifications or any additions that you'd like me to bring up. That'd be cool. I might like to do a, a monthly show where I'm just uh, adding uh, addendums, the... Uh, the, the monthly addendums. So this week we will be covering 55 people th- that cover 13 countries and the average age of the people we mentioned when they passed away was 65. So still probably a bit too young by today's standards but a lot of them had a good innings and a lot of them were cut way too short. So on the 19th of September 1973 which is today, the day I'm recording it was when uh, Graham Parsons passed away, only at the age of 26. And personally, I've I've always loved 
the two albums, I got them in the music library when I was much younger. The two albums he released, uh, and it was just one um, CD. But it is one of my key dead cool moments when I was DJing it in the, the first iteration I did it in. And it was part of like a, f a festival club for uh, visiting filmmakers. And this woman came up and um, requested the, the song I'm about to play. And she went on to tell me that it was her song, if you will, with her a partner who had since passed away. Like when they got their first apartment, they listened to this record over and over. And this particular song was their favorite one. But she'd uh, never heard it loud in public. So it was a joy to play that. Uh, a f few people... You know, well, I suppose you can sing along if you want, but it's a it's a tough one to sing along to. But it's called She, and as a little bit of trivia, the people who are playing uh, with them are the TCB band, which was the Taking Care of Business band, and they were better known as Elvis's band. So listen to some sweet playing, and we're going to have uh, Graham Parsons with She. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
forgotten by everyone She She worked and she slaved so hard The big old field was her backyard In the Delta sun Oh yeah She sure could say This couldn't 
the Temptations with Just My Imagination but we'll go right back to the start of those three songs I didn't actually talk much about Graham Parsons uh, the, the Birds Flying Burrito Brothers International Submarine Band he was a member of all three of them that would be referred to as like the uh, cosmic American music which was massively influenced of course by straight out country music but rhythm and blues folk Soul, but it was that melting pot when rock music had lost its uh, otherness and it was starting to mix with a uh, rock and roll was losing its otherness and becoming more like rock. Um, the, the rock we know now, uh, in fact, he spent a lot of time with Keith Richards, the uh, well, one half of the Rolling Stones, and he's credited. Graham Parsons is credited with kind of opening Keith Richards' mind to just outside the blues and blues rock, which would have then influenced the the, the countrification of the Stones, where now pretty much, you know, every album has at least one country song. Um, as ever, feel free to message and argue about this, or probably better to argue on a Facebook post about it, but as a general rule. So apparently Jagger felt very uh, threatened by Parsons, but maybe that's just the soap opera and it was just three interesting artistic people having their moments. The co-vocalist on that song was Amy Lou Harris. So I'm thinking the, the band First Aid Kit, who had a lovely, lovely, geez, great song uh, called uh, Amy Lou Um there's a great clip of First Aid Kit playing their song at a an event honouring Amy Lou Harris and they name check Grant Parsons in it as well and oh, it's emotional and there's tears everywhere and I suppose that at some point everyone was remembering Grant Parsons at that moment in the cosmos. We followed that with uh, If I Had a Hammer which I realise uh, episode four it's the first time we've played a song for the second time but it was a different version. It was Peter, Paul and Mary that was Mary Travers, who passed away at the age of 72 on the 16th of September 2009. She was one third of that trio and they were right in the the Greenwich Village thing. I know I mentioned uh, the marvellous Miss Maisel, I think two episodes ago, in relation to uh, Joan Rivers, but variations or nods to all the Greenwich Village uh, heavyweights were in the uh, what was called the Gaslight Cafe in Miss Maisel uh, and Peter, Paul and Mary were nodded to. They obviously puffed The Magic Dragon might be their biggest known song, but they were, you know, they were right there. They were there with Pete Seeger. They were there with Bob Dylan. Uh, they shared a manager with Bob Dylan, uh, Albert Grossman, 
perhaps he guided them to be more commercial than their political sentiment originally pointed towards, but it is what it is. But they had some uh, great music, and she, she, in many ways, was the, the face that opened it up the politics of what they were singing about to, you know, the 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 uh, potential audience who were wary of the the beatneck uh, kind of uh, folky uh, righteousness. So, um, fair play to Mary Travers. And then we finished that trio with, as I said, the Temptations, with just my imagination running away with me. Obviously, I could have said it in a far more melodic way, do justice to the song, but that was written and produced by uh, Norman, sorry, Norman Whitfield, who passed away on the 16th of September 2008 at the age of 68. And he was, he's credited with being one of the genuine creators of what we would call the Motown sound. And then specifically that sort of psychedelic soul thing. Another Great Temptation song is uh, Papa, Papa, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Um, there's a really long, like 10 or 13 minute version of it where it goes real psychedelic soul. That's well worth the listen. He, co- he wrote that. He wrote Car Wash. He wrote I Heard It Through the Grapevine. He heard, he, so he wrote War. And apparently one of his um, modus operandi was he would love to, he'd write a song and he'd, make several, well, sorry, at least multiple versions of it. So Edwin Starr wasn't the first person to record it, but they went in that direction with it. which I, I like that broad-mindedness. So he co-wrote or wrote 92 songs that got into the US charts. And if that's not a, a record, it, it's right up there. So it's, it's 92 records. <laughs> but uh, fair play to Norman Whitfield. So the first uh, section I want to talk about is uh, people of note, miscellaneous. So these are people I couldn't find uh, anything particularly in connection with, but these are people from the history books. 1874, we're going back to uh, Charles Amade Kohler, or Cooler. He died at the age of 84. Uh, what did he do? He was a chocolatier, an entrepreneur, and he's the guy who invented hazelnut chocolate. So if you had Nutella recently on a crepe or just use it to keep your child quiet for a while, you've got to thank Charles Emmett Kohler for that. And he's also credited with perhaps, and I love when you put perhaps at the start, with the first combination chocolate bar. So mixing just pure chocolate with ingredients. And I have it in en français. It was... Uh, Chocolat avec des ingrédients amandes, noisettes, raisin et fruit sec. So almonds, hazelnuts, raisins and dried fruit. And that sounds um, relatively healthy. Then 1938, at the age of 37, uh, Thomas Wolfe passed away. Uh, William Faulkner said... And I really like this. He said it was perhaps the greatest talent of their generation of writers for aiming higher than any other writer. I like that, aiming higher. Aim high, you can never fall too low. Um, I can't remember who told me that. I'm going to say my mother taught me that. Um, so the Jack Kerouac, who I mentioned earlier, uh, for On the Road, he would have uh, credited Thomas Wolfe with being a big influence of his as well as uh, Philip Roth also did. And he is, you know, he's a, a modern American literature heavyweight. And I keep referring to my Con Houlihan book that I'm reading. Uh, he There's a great essay in there about Thomas Wolfe and how good he was. Then uh, I'm using a, a Mac computer uh, to record this. And my first computer when I was a boy, was a Commodore 64. So the blur and oasis of Commodores was, of course, uh, uh, Spectrums and Sinclairs. And Clive Sinclair, who was uh, an absolute pioneer in the computing industry, he passed away uh, at the age of 81 in 2021. So only only two years ago, on the 16th of September. 
and uh, the um, I like this as well because I, I studied a bit of entrepreneurship so it's always good to learn from how we gr- it's, it's learn how we grew not succeeded and the times in their sort of what would you call it how, how am I forgetting the word the thing the, the tributes no what, what's it called again um, the tri- not the eulogy how am I forgetting this word the things they write, the debt notices, no, the debt tributes, we'll call them. Uh, they said, uh, Clive Sinclair was a reminder that failure is an essential prelude to success. So if anyone's looking for a bit of wisdom to um, reel off to their kids, there's one. Um, now, if you happen, let me get this right, if you happen to be a high-flying investment banker person, who was uh, quaffing a bit of renowned champagne while flying in to one of New York's best-known airports while perhaps reading Variety magazine um, or some of the other fancy magazines, Vanity Fair or The New Yorker. All four of these people are kind of linked. So um, Rothschild, the guy who was considered the founding father of international finance, and look at the trouble that got us into. Uh, he passed away in 1812 at the age of uh, 68 on the 19th, which is today as I record it. Dom Perignon died in 1715 at the age of 76. He's erroneously credited with the invention of sparkling champagne, but that's not really what happened. Um, he was an advocate of uh, winemaking using only natural processes, so no no foreign substances. And he, uh, th- there's a lot of myths and misnomers about him. He invented blind tasting of wine. That was his thing. So he would taste uh, the grapes without knowing their source vineyard so that that wouldn't um, influence his perception. But it, that morphed into people saying he was blind, but he wasn't. But um, he was the person who introduced blending grapes prior to sending them to press, which then f- fed into champagne making. I really feel that this is low-hanging fruit for someone to c- write in with a, the right to reply. Maybe I should actually, um, yeah, I'll start accepting WhatsApp voice notes and I'll put them in. Yeah, it'd be like mailbag. Uh LaGuardia, LaGuardia, sorry, New York's uh, 99th mayor. He was in office for 12 years um, and he worked very uh, closely with Roosevelt uh, for the New Deal. So he was uh, massively credited with helping reboot uh, New York and obviously New York being the cradle of America uh, after the Great Depression. So LaGuardia Airport is named after him and what did I read? Yeah, he was ranked in a 1993 survey as the best American big city mayor. So I wonder, was there medium city mayors and small city mayors also in there? So fair play to him. And then uh, Condé Nast, who was a publisher, entrepreneur and business magnate. He founded th- that media company that went on to produce Vanity Fair, Vogue. And Sinead O'Connor. Anyway, not Sinead O'Connor, the New Yorker. I've jumped ahead. Uh, Sinead O'Connor was definitely featured in the New Yorker, so that's I've, I've covered my mistake there. We are now going to go about, oh, about 180 kilometres, I think, from my, my studio where I'm recording, to a tumble-down shack in Athlone. We are going to listen to John McCormack, um who passed away in 1945 at the age of 61 on the 16th of September. Take it away, John. Are so fair, I 
like the wind through my tree. She rides the night next to me. She leads me through moonlight, only to burn me with the sun. She's taking my heart. She doesn't know what she's done. Feel the breath in my face. Her body close to me. Can't look in her eyes. She's out of my league. Just a fool to believe I have anything she needs. She's like the wind. like the wind there by Patrick Swayze but let's go to the first of those three songs so that was we started with John McCormack with Tumble Down Shack in Athlone obviously John McCormack was one of the biggest stars of his time uh, from Athlone originally uh, even like he, he made his name and fortune in America and around the world he was a uh, incredibly Catholic person. He was one of, a, a, I believe he was a papal knight. He was, but he was Catholic day and night. Um, one of the biggest selling artists of, of his day, huge um, reputation, massively lauded for both opera and popular song. His repertoire was huge. Uh, I chose that particular song just because it is uh, a song I got introduced to by my father and it's about my uh, ancestral homeland. Um, That's also just a a lovely song. Uh, The reason I just mentioned Sinead O'Connor by accident was because it's written on my notes that he he was buried in uh, Dean's Grange and some of the other people that were buried there include uh, Brian O'Nolan who'd be better known, or Brian O'Nolan, better known as Flann O'Brien, Sinead O'Connor and Dermot Morgan. So I was thinking the four of them, that would be a pretty good 
table quiz team. I'm always, I love trying to find connections between four celebrities and if they'd be a good table quiz team. Uh, following that, we had Bill Evans with Walls for Debbie. Now, um, my seventh point f about Bill Evans was uh, the music critic uh, Richard Ginnell wrote that uh, with the passage of time, Bill Evans has become an entire school unto himself for pianists and a singular mood unto himself for listeners. There is no more influential jazz orientated pianist. Um, only McCoy Tyner exerts nearly as much pull among younger players and journeymen. So that gives you an insight just to how broad his career was. Probably best known for his work slash relationship with Miles Davis, which uh, when it was good, it was very good. <laughs> That's how we might describe the relationship. It's it's not for me to just make fleeting references to people's uh, addiction issues and uh, personal lives and stuff. But one thing, if you fast forward into Bill Evans' life, is he he had a problem with uh, drug addiction, which apparently Miles Davis tried to help him kick that addiction, but it did not succeed, and it certainly would have affected their working relationship um, even though their work they were creating was so good uh, yeah, and Bill Evans not only was one a regular contributor with our, our collaborator with Miles Davis Freud but he also wrote the liner notes and stuff like that so if you ever sat down with um, a kind of blue I think <laughs> You think I'd have got the album in front of me, but he he also wrote the liner notes, which is a, a long past tradition. He won his first Grammy, I noticed, for best jazz international sorry instrumental album, and it was just him on all three tracks. He started he used the method of overdubbing, which was very new at the time, nineteen sixty four. Just around the same time, uh, Mr. Paul McCartney was saying, I'll give that a go, see what I can come up with. So if you want to listen to a, an album called Conversation With Myself, it's him playing three different but corresponding piano tracks. He Now, of course, we have a house rule here at Dead Cool Show that um, Grammys and other awards, they don't measure anyone's talent, but they're a handy way of signifying something. So he received uh, 31 Grammy nominations and he won it seven times. He's in the Downbeat Jazz Hall of Fame. Uh, I don't know what what the Upbeat Jazz Hall of Fame thinks of him. No, Downbeat was the name of the magazine. He, at, at a time of segregation, he was in a relationship with a, a black woman. And, for instance, there's a litany of stories that they weren't allowed to book into the hotel's of places he was playing concerts. Um, I have nothing to add to that, but it's always, we shouldn't forget that times were like that. And uh, if you saw the film La La Land, uh, he was the main uh, wardrobe influence for Ryan Gosling's uh, character. And then follow that, we had Patrick Swayze with She's Like the Wind, obviously better known as an actor. Uh, Roadhouse would be a personal favourite. I know a lot of people love him in Point Break. I still haven't seen that. He was also in The Outsiders, which I I really liked. That was 1983. Donnie Darko, he had a great role in that. But obviously, Dirty Dancing would be his probably his biggest known film. That was the first film to sell a million copies on video. And obviously, the soundtrack was very big as well. And that's where Patrick really came in to his own because he had written that song anyway. He didn't write it for the film but because the budget for Dirty Dancing was so low um, they gave him a hundred percent of the licensing and when the soundtrack did so well he made a lot of money it's been credited that he'd made more money from that song than any film I'm not able to work that out uh, if if I get enough Patreons I might file a freedom of information to his bank but I'd say we can all live without it but I do notice, uh, so sorry, Patrick Swayze died uh, 2009, uh, 
which is quite long ago really, but it still feels quite recent at the age of 57 on the 14th of September. And four years later, his mother passed away, Patsy Swayze, four, day, four years and two days later, um, which I, I know she was a, a choreographer and she was the choreography, if you don't, if you haven't seen Urban Cowboy, well then it's irrelevant because you won't remember the choreography, but if you have seen it, that was her. And I noticed very sadly she was predeceased by three of her children. Um, I once again, this podcast isn't about morbidity, but it is. It's always there. Fourteenth uh, of September, nineteen eighty-two. Grace Kelly passed away. The, it, the, the I, I I often hear of it uh, referred to as as a car crash, but it was actually a, a, a mild cerebral hemorrhage. I don't know why I feel the need to clarify that, but it, it, it's on my mind. Uh, 2017, 15th of September, at the age of 91, we lost Harry Dean Staunton. Uh, Twin Peaks, he was Carl Rod in that. Uh, he was the lead in Paris, Texas, and Lucky, which was a, a lovely film which came out very shortly before he passed away, where he was playing perhaps a... a not an exaggeration of himself, but it was about a man towards the end of his life. Uh, it was a, it was sort of a, a portrait of that, so that was quite moving. But he f- featured in some of the most interesting films of the last 40, 50 years. So Cool Hand Luke, always a personal favourite. He was in The Green Mile, he was in The Last Temptation of Christ, and he also released, I think, two albums. So I was going to play some of his music, but... We've enough from people who where music was their main thing, he says, after playing Patrick Swayze. And then um, two people I wanted, three people I wanted to have a look at, women that I hadn't heard of, to be honest, until I started researching this week. Uh, 1966, uh, on the 14th of September, at the age of 66, uh, Gertrude Berg uh, passed away. She was the winner of the first... Best Actress Emmy in 1950 with a she was playing Molly in a TV show called so it was a radio show and then it went on to be a TV show called Rise of the Goldbergs which has nothing to do with the TV show The Goldbergs which is on now but she was one of the first women to create write produce and star in her own serial comedy drama and that started in 1929. Uh, so she, she would be considered like a pioneer of, of what would be called kind of classic radio, the kind of stuff we know now, the old uh, soap boxes and uh, the Hank Williams radio shows and across across the states on all the different um, regional stations pulling together. Gertrude Berg, she would have been a, a star. In the year 2000, at the age of 80, we lost... B. Richards, also on the 14th of September. Guess who's coming to dinner? She was Sidney Poitier's mother. She received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress for that. She wrote a lot about the experience of black women in America, which it was a pretty tumultuous time between, uh, you know, what she would have been an adult from like 19... 35 till she passed away so that's a there was a lot to say there so she wrote a collection of 14 pieces in a f- book or a play or show called A Black Woman Speaks and in which she put a, a spotlight on the way white women played an important role in oppressing women of colour uh, I'm throwing that hand grenade and moving on then 19, sorry, in 2002, at the age of 81, we lost Lawanda Page. That was the stage name of Alberta Richmond. I have been watching a lot of her on YouTube. Um, It was of its time, obviously, but she was one of the first blue comedians that was a a woman and also a, a black woman. She was best known for a TV show where she may, you know, I'm sure people would say, you couldn't do it now, in uh, 
Sanford and Son. She was uh, Aunt Esther, the Bible-toting, sharp-tongued Aunt Esther. But she did a lot of stuff with, um, like, body rooms. And w- women can't say that. She was in the uh, one of the first specials called w- Women, women t- Tell the Dirtiest Jokes or something like that. She was very involved in comedy roasts with people like Betty White, Frank Sinatra. But... Um, yeah, she was a real pioneer as well. She was called the, the, the queen of comedy in her, in her time. So they were all people from the stage. Now we're going to go back to music, but Maria, Calle, Maria Callas, my very first interaction or connection to her was the R.E.M. song, Ebo the Letter, with Maria Callas, whoever she is. But I think it's Maria Calais when you say her name. So I, I don't know, was that Michael Stipe doing wordplay or me overthinking it right now? Text in. If, a, if it, I'm overthinking. B, if it was wordplay. But Maria Calais, Callis, uh, she received her musical education in Athens, even though she was born in America. Um, but I, I noticed that she, she received her education in Athens and R.E.M., founded in Athens, Athens, Georgia. So there's something for you to remember. But she, one of the most in- incredible female vocalists of all time, like she dominated the stage of in opera. I suppose you could call some of them torch songs, but more so it's just the, the, the depth and the drama and the beauty of, of her voice. And if you've seen the film Philadelphia, there's that beautiful scene where Andrew Beckett is describing opera, even though it, it's a simile for life and emotion um, or metaphor. Uh, but it's her performance, which is La Mama Morta. Now, I was tempted to play the scene from Philadelphia, but I realised we don't need <laughs> we don't need a a, a man doing a live, uh, what would you call it, commentary, telling you how to understand it. But I urge you to go back and watch Philadelphia after this. And then we're going to follow it with Mark Bolan from T-Rex, or who founded T-Rex. And I noticed, while he died at the age of 29, and she died at the age of 53, they died on the exact same day, which was the 16th of September, 1977. So here we go, La Mama Morta.
was dancing when I was twelve. I was dancing when I was twelve. I was dancing when I was out. I was dancing when I was out. I danced myself right out the room. myself right at the womb Is it strange to dance so soon I dance myself right at the womb I was dancing when I was eight I was dancing when I was eight Is it strange to dance so late? Is it strange to dance so late?
should I be afraid to die? There's no reason for it. You've got to go sometime. So, the great gig in the sky, which I realise is a good tagline for what this whole dead cool thing is about. Uh, I'm listening back to the playback and I, I too am hearing the squeak of the mic refund stand, the squeak of my chair and I think the squeak of my knees. I will endeavour to fix them. The, the, each episode is taking me nearly... 10 hours uh, because I, of the, the research I do and I, I'm genuinely loving doing it but I'm going to have to streamline things including how I record this to make sure that it just sounds that little bit better but I do appreciate you listening and uh, hopefully supporting <laughs> me even if you're supporting me in the future for enjoying what I'm doing now. The point I wanted to make about that is, oh, so yeah, so the keyboard player of that song, Richard Wright, passed away at the age of 65, uh, 15 years ago, uh, on the 15th of September. Now, he was a one of the founding members of Pink Floyd. Well, so he was one of the, what would you call 
was he one of the founding members? He wasn't okay. He wasn't the founding member, but he was uh, the the guy on keys <laughs> when they made their main stuff. But he also was a very old and dear friend of Sid Barrett, the original singer of Pink Floyd. And when Sid Barrett left, I think they were living in a flat together at the time, but. He didn't leave. He was forced out. And uh, once again, hopefully it wouldn't happen now. Hopefully we'd have more um, subtlety and understanding. But when he did leave, Richard Wright considered leaving and forming a band with him, but decided it wasn't practical, even though he did play on Barrett's uh, solo albums and stuff like that. I realise I'm saying stuff and uh, a lot. I'll have to work on that too. The Great Gig in the Sky is one of the few songs in the Pink Floyd canon that Richard Wright actually has a song writing credit for. So I picked that one in particular, but but also because that's from the Dark Side of the Moon album. And another person I want to talk about today is Hippolyte Fizou, who died in 1896 on the 18th of September. He was a scientist who had a few uh, claims to notoriety. But one of them is that there's a crater on the far side of the moon named after him. So there we go. There's our connection. It's called the crater Fizu, F-I-Z-E-A-U. He, Fizu, is one of the 72 names inscribed in the Eiffel Tower, of which was to who, all of whom were French scientists, mathematicians, engineers, uh, from the from like the, pr- the the preceding century of the 1889 World Fair from which the tower was built and of the 72 Fizu was the only one who was still alive when the tower was open so he was he was a, he was a he was a heavy hitter he was involved with the discovery of the Doppler effect which essentially is noise sounds different slash quieter the further away it is from you and write to you and then as it goes away uh, what, what's, what what's those things on the ambulance a siren would be probably the best example and also in 1849 he measured the speed of light to within 5% accuracy so fair play there he was able to measure it also he also did an experiment which is now called the Fizu experiment where he was able to measure the speed of light uh in moving water, which, look, I know it's impressive, but I've no idea of how impressive that actually is. At the age of 82, in 1976, on the 16th of September, Bertha Lutz, Lutz passed away. She was a Brazilian powerhouse, I suppose. She was very involved in the feminist movement and the human rights movement, which of course the two of those intersect massively. She was massively instrumental in women's suffrage in Brazil. She represented Brazil at the UN. One of the people who signed the UN Charter on international organisation. And as well as political work, she was a naturalist, specialising in poison dart frogs. I've never been in South America I assume it is more of an issue there than here, but it's still pretty cool. Poison dart frogs. She has four frog species and two lizard species named after her. So she wins to this week's episode of Who is the Most Animals Named After Them? Susan Le Flesh Picot died in 1915 at the age of 50. She was a, as we it's always how do you what do you say she was a a Native American medical doctor and a member of the Omaha tribe indigenous and first nation I know are other terms Uh, please write in and tell me what I'm supposed to be saying because I do want to learn properly but indigenous and first nation I'm saying without a um, meaning to be disingenuous if I'm saying the wrong thing. She was the first uh, Indigenous woman to receive a medical de- degree in America, one of the very first Indigenous people and the first Indigenous woman. She, Her whole life was campaigning for public health 
and like legal uh, recognition and a, uh, what would you call allotment of land to members of the Omaha tribe, uh, school hygiene, food sanitation for the the wider community of of people. Uh, they mightn't all have been in the Omaha tribe, but were Native American and tuberculosis was a huge issue uh, for them and she really fought against the, sp the spread of that. They reckon in a 450 square mile area she treated over 1,300 patients in her career. So that's that's a lot. Uh, I, I could barely mind myself. 1989, at the age of 19, uh, at the age of 73, uh, Olga Eretzek passed away. She had a, she held patents for over 30 things. She was a designer, uh, a lingerie company owner and an undergarment designer. Polish-American. She fled Poland in 1941. I don't know. I'll let you work out why she might have fled Poland in 1941. First to Russia, then Japan, then America. So she really... Uh, if if you had a map of things that happened in World War Two, she 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 saw the whole thing. Uh, well, if she did. She wasn't there. She fled, brought her children over. She was known. She was famous for her nightgowns with a full flowing skirt and a generous sweep. So I don't know if they're worn much anymore, but we've surely seen them. Once again, we'll use marvelous Miss Maisel, Maisel as my reference point. She wears those kind of things. Then William Burroughs, the first, died at the age of 41 in, in 1898. William Burroughs, you say? There's been a lot of talk of beat generation writing already. So he was William S. Burroughs' grandfather. And he was uh, an inventor, uh, an originator. He invented the calculating machine in 1885, which went on to be the what we'd call the, the not like a till in a shop but in those old ones I think you would have seen them in Mad Men and stuff the ones banks used to do the thing so essentially the calculator and he also invented the electric alarm clock in 1892 but uh, 1892 I was going to make a 24 hour joke but that doesn't work so oh well what could have been? So anyway, William S. Burroughs. So th those last few people are all people who originated or invented stuff. And these next three musicians, I'll talk more in depth after I've played their music. But these are three people who are massively connected with huge breakthroughs. So the first person I'm going to play is a guy called Jimmy Yancey, who is considered like one of the originators of Boogie Woogie Piano. So his... What he does with his left hand is he was the guy who did it. Or that's the guy who's credited with it. So what? Li listen out for that. And then listen to the drumming of the next song. The next song we're playing is Fats Domino, but listen to the drumming for a guy called Earl, Earl Palmer. This song, this particular song, The Fat Man, the, the backbeat he uses in this or sets in this apparently is the first time someone did that. So this is where rock, you know, if it's got a backbeat, you can't lose it. This is it. And uh, we're going to follow that with Jimi Hendrix. And this song, which is bold as love, spoiler alert, is the first recording of what's known as stereo phasing. So l listen out to that guitar sound. So we're, we're taking away Jimmy Yancey and I'll talk to you after this.
metallic purple armor Queen jealousy envy waits behind her Her fiery green gown stares at the grassy ground Blue are the life-giving waters take her for granted They quietly understand Once happy turquoise armies lay opposite ready But wonder why the fight is on But they're all Jimi Hendrix there uh, acts as bold as love. So to go right back to the start there, we had Yancey Stomp by Jimmy Yancey. So as I was saying, the, the, his left hand was a, is credited with starting that uh, kind of piano rapid fire uh, playing style. You might have noticed at the end of it, it was just really abrupt finish. Uh, says me, <laughs> let he who is without ab- abrupt endings and edits cast a first stone. But he he was credited with that because apparently, um, like a a record label would hire him to record like a load of seventy eights in one go, and there'd be a, a knock or a signal from the producer going, "Okay, we're at that's you know we're at we're at two minutes forty five seconds. Finish it up," and he'd just stop. He would be playing for hours in bars 
entertaining the the bourgeois, bourgeoisie. Um, why do I pick the the, top, the fancy words to try and impress you? Um, and he just stopped the, the track, which is uh, brilliant. Uh, when, when you're that good, you don't need to have finesse at the end as well. Uh, so it, it, it's in sometimes referred to as Yancey bass, that uh, left-handed playing. Uh, if you've ever seen um, later with Jules Holland, that he's leaning heavily into that. Uh, if if he doesn't know the the song too well, just let let the left hand do the work. Then followed that was Earl Palmer. Now he is considered one of the inventors of rock and roll. As I was saying, he was a drummer. He was a member of the Wrecking Crew. The you know the, there's a ten episode. <laughs> Dead Cool Show thing just on them to be made eventually uh, in his obituary. That's the word, obituary, from earlier. They, it said, his list of credits read like a who's who of American popular music for the last 60 years. He actually died only in 2008 at the age of 83. Jimmy De- Yancey died in 1951 at the age of 56. But getting back to Earl Palmer, he, I have a, I have a different tab with all the gigs not all the people he played with Beach Boys Glenn Campbell Sam Cooke like Twisting the Night Away he's the drummer on that B.B. Um, King Peggy Lee some of the Monkeys stuff Little Richard like Little Richard's early stuff the the stuff that then went on that you know changed the Beatles and, and their direction uh, Elvis Costello had him later uh, in whatever the made it Mid eighties, I'd say, yeah, mid eighties. Fifth Dimension, where I'm, I don't know if he played on Up, Up and Away, the Jimmy Webb song, but let's let's say he did. But Fats Domino, he, uh, where which we just heard there, uh, Bobby Gentry, one of the Everleys, Gloria Jones, actually, he he sung with, um, or sorry, played drums with, and Gloria Jones. To loop back to Mark Boland, Gloria Jones was Mark Boland's partner when um, he he passed away, and they had a kid together. Um, he was once credited with by the Musicians Union for playing four hundred and fifty gigs in just nineteen sixty seven. He would have played a. Uh, in se- sessions and live performances so sometimes two a day look at that now here's the thing he is reportedly the first person to use the word funky to explain like his the, the swing to make music or th- and the drummers uh, what would you call it the the drummer's ability to make things more sort of danceable so apparently he's the guy who used funky for that and if you think of it, like, <laughs> we've all used that word. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming. I'm going to say most people listening have used that word. And he's the guy who did it. Earl Palmer, fair play. Not just a drummer, a wordsmith as well. And then we finished there with Jimi Hendrix. He claims that claimed that his great-great-grandfather was Irish. So we'll, we'll take that. We've had uh, US presidents come here and we've named plazas. After them, in the for for the same Jimi Hendrix, he was the highest paid performer at Woodstock. He is the first pop star to have one of those blue heritage plaques raised for them in his uh, apartment. Which, well, freedom of information, GDPR, be damned. Twenty three Brook Street. So that was the first pop star to have it. His debut album is one of the 50 recorded recordings added by the Library of Congress to the what was called the is called the US National Recording Registry to quote be preserved for all time as part of the nation's audio legacy and as we were talking earlier that track was one of the first times to use stereophonic phasing and the rock and roll hall of fame described him as arguably the greatest instrumentalist in the history of rock music. So both Earl Palmer and Jimi Hendrix are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now to do a little bit of politics, uh, 
This is Politics Corner. This is a podcast of several corners. But in 1803, at the age of 25, on the 20th of September, so tomorrow, if you're listening to it, on the 19th, which is probably today, if you will, because I'm uploading it. And if obviously most people are going to list this just at not particular times. So let's just say the 20th of September and that, let that be that. Robert Emmett was uh, executed hung, drawn and quartered, I believe, for executed for high treason. He was a national Irish nationalist, patriot, rebel leader. He led a rebellion that, uh, spoiler alert, didn't work in 1803. But Podrick Pierce in 1916 referred to him as not a failure, but a triumph for that deathless thing we called Irish nationality. He... He did what's known as Emmett's speech from the dock is what he gave from the dock when he was um, condemned to death. And the historian Patrick Gagan identified over 70 different versions of the text. So let's see if I can find the definitive one. Read that out. Uh, So that was Robert Emmett. Then 42 years later, at the age of 30, Thomas Davis uh, in 1845 I'm not a historian and even when we talk about Irish politics of then there's people who know more than me who immediately correct me so he was he was in and around the time of Daniel O'Connell and they agreed about a lot of broad strokes but disagreed about a few things and one of Thomas Davis's main things that O'Connell wasn't on board with was advocating for Irish to be the national language of Ireland if and when we uh, became a a free nation again. And he's also the guy who wrote A Nation Once Again. So there's a certain band that are getting a lot of sold out shows now uh, and that's one of their songs. It was written by Thomas Davis and if you live in Mallow there's a fine old uh, statue, isn't there? Yeah, about half, halfway down the main street, down from the, well, down from the centra, in between the centra and the library, I think. If you're in Mallow, feel free to correct me. Then 1964, a good hundred and odd years later, at the age of 84, Sean O'Casey passed away, of best known as a playwright. Uh, Shadow of a Gunman, Juno and the Peacock, Plough and the Stars. But he was also an Illin Piper, and he was the founder of the St. Lawrence O'Toole Pipe Band, along with a few other names you might recognise, Podrick Pierce, Thomas Clark, Sean McDermott, Arthur Griffith, Douglas Hyde. So he, he, was, he was at the top table and he was a member at different times of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union and the Irish Citizen Army. I'm doing a gig myself in Liberty Hall this Monday. So I... Bet you I'm going to be talking about Sean O'Casey to people who are probably tired of people like me talking about Sean O'Casey. But who tires of... He who tires of talking of Sean O'Casey is tired of life. Okay, much more recently, at the age of 87, uh, in 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. The RB, the notorious RBG, the um, what's, liberal uh, judge, the... Uh, there's two or three great documentaries and so much written about her when she passed away but if you haven't heard of her read it, read up on her yourself brilliant brilliant woman uh, and then Dead Cool does not support the concept of monarchy in any way we were referring to the queen of comedy earlier but Louis the oh God, XV8 Louis oh Louis the 18th Louis the 8th oh. How am I getting this wrong? This is embarrassing, and of course I could stop. X, V, I, I, I. That's 18, isn't it? Louis the 18th. Okay, well, look, that's embarrassing. Anyway, boo, there we go. But the, this is incredible stuff that you want to hear about. It is, it, look, if you're eating, stop eating. I want to go scroll down to his death. Now, he was, when he died, he was experiencing... Obesity, gout and gangrene, both dry and wet. 
in his legs and spine. That is, say you're a monarch without saying you're a monarch, but his, as a historical footnote, the young science of disinfection had had advanced around the time he died and they'd recognised that chlorides of lime could be used to eliminate smells and slow decomposition. So his body was washed with chlorides. So when they presented his corpse to the public, they were able to present it without any odour, was, was which makes it sound like a detergent of some sort. And I, I'd rather a deterrent against monarchy. Okay, we're well past the halfway stage. Uh, we are going to play three pieces of music that don't really have much in common, but they're, except the, the main people on it, are dead and they died at some point in history this week. But this is my find of the week. I have been listening to this particular piece of music over and over. I don't know if it's the definitive version of it, but it's so it's conducted by the, the person who composed it, who died at the age of 91 in 1957 on the 20th of September Jean or Jean Sibelius he's widely regarded as the greatest composer to come from Finland it was credited with helping develop the national identity of Finland while it struggled for independence from Russia we've just been talking about people who tried to help Ireland find their own identity away from England the this is Matt. His th- his death was announced in the UN General Assembly, like while it was in session, when it had been announced, and the president of the assembly, who was the Leslie Munro from New Zealand, like there in that moment, del- delivered a eulogy, which I doubt he had prepared, which was, and I. This is really sticking with me. Sibelius belongs to the whole world, belonged to the whole world. He enriched the life of the entire human race with his music. Now, fast forward to now, Sibelius belongs to the whole world in another way, because the, there's a music program that is, it's the largest selling music notation program in the world. Uh, it's used for editing and printing music scores and creating them, of course. So before, if a musician wanted to write a score, they'd have those huge, thick books and would have to be writing. Like, you've you've seen them all. Uh, Sibelius himself at the start would have used them. And now it's just completely... It's democratised. It's way more accessible. So that's incredible. And it also uses synthesizers and stuff so people can develop work, which is... Brilliant. Um, in 2021, his manuscripts was included in a, a project called the Memory of the World Programme by UNESCO, which is to safeguard the documentary heritage of humanity against collective amnesia, neglect, decay over time, climactic conditions, as well as deliberate destruction. So anyway, OK, so this particular piece was performed by the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra, conducted by him, and it's called Andante Festivo, uh, JS34B, version for strings and timpani. Now, I present this without prejudice, but I'm going to take some safe money. I'll take a safe bet that uh, a certain Nick Cave uh, listened and heard this, and it stuck in his mind because it must have moved him because I think you'll hear bits in it that might be similar to one of his most uh, moving uh, songs. And this is there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, I'm not throwing any shade at Nick Cave. In fact, I'm, in fact I, I'm openly encouraging him and inviting him onto the show. But here we go uh, with Adate Festivo.
See a tiny brush. Hey, what a terrible brush. Not the tree don't just cause him don't like the rush. Cause a tiny brush, yeah. We out of sight, not the have by sight. We out of sight, not the have by sight. Not the tree don't fight. Not the tree don't fight, cause him know him of the height and him of my sight, yeah. Not true! Sure. What did them dread? Yonder discipline, every, every discipline. Go to yonder discipline, every, every discipline. Yeah. Nothing go to yonder discipline. Nothing trade don't trust, cause him don't like the rush. And him don't use a brush. Singing say a China brush, yeah. War in the east and a war in the west War in the north and a war in the south Crazy Joe get them out What a terrible bout Crazy Joe get them out, yeah Not the trade don't trust Cause him don't like the rush And him don't use the brush Cause a shiny brush What a terrible brush, yeah 
At the tree don't borrow Cause the men bought tomorrow Don't like sorrow Yeah At the tree don't borrow Well what try man personal no like I am War in the east and a war in the north War in the west and a war in the south Crazy Joe get them out Now what a terrible bout, yeah Them say it's the right of mine But watch ya man When chai's with you, any guys can be against you At the tree don't borrow cause remember tomorrow you don't like sorrow Say a war in the east and a war in the west and a war in the south Crazy Jew again So that was Prince Farai uh, with Discipline um, 1983 he passed away at just the age of 38 We've had a lot of uh, Jamaican artists over the last few weeks. We'd uh, Peter Tosh and we'd Toots. But this is another person, someone I'd have known the least until I started really getting into that kind of music. He was he was known as the Voice of Thunder. And he considered himself a chanter rather than a toaster. And these are big differences in uh, the dance hall world. He was known for his gruff voice and critical assessment of, well, the Jamaican government, I suppose, Jamaican governments. And he was a mentor to Adrian Sherwood, who is alive, so we don't care. Um, but he was a very prominent uh, producer for a lot of the music I particularly liked in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, before that, we had uh, Skeeter Davis, who is kind of considered the first female solo vocalist that was a star in country music. She was a huge influence on Tommy Wynette and Dolly Parton. She was a friend of June Carter, a good friend of June Carter. The two of them were in the, the Grand Ole Opry since uh, 1959 they joined it. That song we played there, The End of the World, you might remember it from Fallout 4, that popular video game. I won't lie, I not only don't know it, I don't I can't visualise it. I don't even know what platform it was on, but I'm sure it was... I know it's a big one. I've heard of Fallout because another thing I do, um, I think with the Ink Spots, they they were on it as well. But that particular song, The End of the World, was also named by both Lou Reed and Lana Del Rey as some of their favourite recordings of all time. It's just a gorgeous song. And I noticed she's credited with penning nearly 70 songs. And I will say, with a bit of a surety, she wrote hundreds of songs and she had to fight to get credited with nearly 70 of them. Now we're reaching the stage of um, people we couldn't mention <laughs> because of time. Uh, this is a long podcast and I would love some feedback. Part of me is thinking of breaking it into different sections and releasing them in parts. But also, you're a grown up, I assume. And you could just pause it and come back if you want. And I just like the way it ties up to be one big tapestry. But feedback welcome. So a couple of sports people. In 2021, Jimmy Greaves passed away at the age of 81. Uh, the highest goal scorer in the history of English top flight football. Because obviously a lot of people act like football got invented in 1992 with the Premier League. But it wasn't. So he had 357 goals. He was the top scorer at the top flight in six different seasons, more times than any other player has ever done it. Now, obviously, Haaland might do it, but we'll come back to me in seven years, even though, of course, he's going to go to Spurs. Uh, Jimmy Grease himself left England and went abroad. and But when he came back... No, sorry, he, he didn't leave. When he came back from abroad... He joined Spurs for £999,000 because the manager at the time, Bill Nicholson, didn't want him to have the pressure of being the first £100,000 player. What did I say? I said £99,000, didn't I? I did. So one pound short of hundred grand, which is hilarious to think because now pretty average players in the Premier League get paid that per week. And they don't want the pressure of having less. They want the pressure of having more. 
So he scored 402 goals in 617 appearances. Now, one thing he said is he regretted that he never signed for Brian Clough, who died in 2004 at the age of 69. So if you want to do some quick maths, 17, they were actually very similar ages. So it's interesting to see Jimmy Greaves thinking he could have signed for him as a manager, which would have helped the second half of his career. He was known for his successes, mainly with Knott's Forest. Well, I associate him with Knott's Forest because just he was still manager then when I was becoming aware of him. But he managed both Derby, Derby County and Nottingham Forest. He won the league with both of them. He's one of only four managers to have done that, win the league with two different clubs. Uh, he's he's much loved by both clubs. The massive rivalry between the two, but they um, really celebrate his life every time they play. It's called the Brian Clough Trophy, and it, it it swaps hands depending on who wins it. Both clubs had very little history of success or pedigree, uh, so their wins they're the real underdog stories but he himself scored 251 goals in 274 games and his career was cut short I think he played at Sunderland at the time maybe it was Middlesbrough I can't remember which order with a knee injury which now would probably be easily a bit of surgery and he'd been back back on the pitch but two of the greatest strikers to ever play football okay 2010 the age of 77 a high school teacher called Leonard Skinner died and he was the high school teacher of all the members of the band who made up Leonard Skinner and they named their band after him and apparently they named it after him as a sort of a a, a nod to the fact that he used to be at them to cut their long hair, that hippie hair because the rule, hair, I'm trying to say the rules were that they weren't allowed of long hair and it was, a, it was a different time. 1981 a guy called Furry Lewis died, he was, uh, well he was either 82 but he could have been as old as 88. He was one of the very early blues musicians that would have played in the 1920s that when there was the blues revival in the 60s he was one of the first people to be brought out and played and like they sat him down and just they said play everything you know and then they became recordings I think Lomax was one of the people who worked with him Alan Lomax who recorded him but here we go he spent his most of his adult life working as a street sweeper in Memphis and he only retired in 1966 which would have been he would have been about maybe 65. I'm doing some rough maths. Maybe 75. I shouldn't be doing this in public. 15 minus 82 minus 15. 60. Yeah, about 65. So he, he he earned his retirement. So Furry Lewis. Then we had Ethel Johnson, uh, who died in 2018, at the age of 83. She was the first African American women's wrestling champion. She was nine. She was only sixteen at the time. Obviously, the the U.S. sports entertainment circuit. It was, you know, look. It's not sport. It's sports entertainment. But you still get hurt when you fall. And she was the called the biggest attraction to hit girl wrestling since girl wrestling began. In 1841, Alessandro Rolla died at the age of 84. He was. The, he performed the first viola concerto ever heard, apparently, in 1772. He was the teacher of the great Paganini. We were talking earlier about the originators of rock and roll's drum beat or backbeat. He uh, he was behind the technical innovation of left hand pizzicato, uh, chromatic ascending and descending scales, the use of high positions on violins and viola. Uh, these were all things he introduced. So, fair play to him. He was the orchestral director, the, so de facto leader of the La Scala Orchestra in Milan in 1802. Not, not many people get that job. It's the hotbed of opera. And this is one beautiful thing. Bertini, a historian of his time, said, reported, that Rolla was prohibited from playing in public because women could not hear him without fainting or suffering attacks of nerves. But that is a good reason to be saying you can't play gigs. 2004, the age of 55, Johnny Ramone died. Uh, one of the 
two original, only the, one of the only two members, along with Joey Ramone, who were in the Ramones throughout until they finished in 1996. Now the two of them had a acrimonious relationship due to, of course, a woman. Uh, Johnny married a woman who was going out with Joey. Uh, I imagine he did marry her straight away. I imagine they also had a relationship. But that's the kind of stuff that people fall out over. You might remember Father, the excellent Father Ted episode where they're trying to write the Eurovision hit. And there is the Dougal and Ted are having that really tense, oh, play the beeping note, play the beeping note. Now, that is a nod to certain things that Oasis were done, were, co- were recorded, I think called Sibling Rivalry where they had a big fight in the studio and it was recorded. And the same things with the Kinks did it. They had a, a, an argument recorded that was leaked. But there's a famous story that Phil Spector, when he was producing the Ramones, held Johnny Ramone at gunpoint, forcing him to repeatedly uh, play a riff over and over. So that's one of Johnny Ramone's biggest contributions to rock and roll was that riff. Well, as well as loads of other songs. So, like, do you remember Rock and Roll Radio? That would have been one of his ones. That's one of my favourite Ramon songs. Jackie Collins, at the age of 77, in 2005, died. She was a romance novelist. She was an actress as well. I think she, oh, I can't Dynasty she was in, maybe. But she wrote The Stud in 1969. She wrote The Bitch. She wrote Hollywood Wives, 1983. The Power Trip, as late as 2012. So that's a very long, encompassing writing career. That what's 1969 to 2012. That's over 50 years, anyway. Uh, in 2018, at the age of 91, Bunny Carr died. He was a Irish TV star in the 60s up to the 80s. He, he hosted a TV show. I, I just so vaguely remember. It stopped in 1981. I was born in 1980, but there was bits of it repeated on TV called Quicksilver and the catchphrase stop the lights is still used like stop the lights and uh, apologies to people whose accent feels that I have just uh, appropri- appropriated them he had a TV show called Teen Talk uh, on RTE as well in 1973 he sort of left RTE and started his own well he didn't leave them but he stepped outside of RTE to start his own public relations company where he trained people to speak in public which included training our Tishig, which is our prime ministers it's six different Tishig he trained to speak to the public so maybe he started a bit of the problem we have now where they're, they're great at talking or coming across like they're great talkers says me without delivering much from what they say uh, only two years ago, at the age of 61, Norm MacDonald passed away, the comedian, the stand-up comedian, very funny man. And then there's two people I want to refer to that, as time allows, I'm going to start doing deeper dives on these people. Laura Ashley, the fashion designer and businesswoman. Uh, she died at the age of 60 in 1985. But, it, you know, the, the kind of stuff, you know, your aunts have. But... I learned since that when her company got off the ground, they did loads of stuff with that money. They didn't just become a rich family. So there's a, a foundation that the family started. Now, when she passed away, her husband and children took a, a leading role in it. But they support a broad range of arts, community and social welfare projects in England and Wales with a particular interest in supporting rural communities in Wales. So hopefully I'm going to get an interview with one of them so we can talk about her in a greater depth then there was a woman who was born Kathleen Jean Mary Ruska but uh, by the time she died she at the age of 72 she went by the name of Ujuru Nunukal she was a massive political activist artist educator centering around Aboriginal rights she wrote the first book to be published by an Aboriginal woman. They go by First Nationers as well, I believe, but it was called We Are Going. The She is probably Australia's highest selling poet. These things are hard to measure because of, uh, you know, 
the, the same poems being in different uh, books and different uh, editions, but she's an incredible woman. I'll be putting some recordings of her reading her poetry up on uh, different social media over the week. And then another high-selling Australian was Slim Dusty. Uh, 106 albums. He was working on his 106th album when he died at the age of 76 in 2003. He's considered the king of Australia's country music. He was the first Australian to have a sort of international hit with a pub with no beer. He sold 7 million records of just his own records in Australia, which stands out. And if you remember the, the Olympic Games that were in Sydney, he was he sung Waltzing Matilda at the closing ceremony. So like his version, like Waltzing Matilda must be one of those songs that everyone knows, even if they don't know it. And his version is the definitive version of it. These are the kind of things that really make me enjoy making dead cool just remembering people naming them giving them credit and thanks for sticking with me to the end of episode four we're going to finish with two songs we were in australia for the last two people we're going to go a little bit next door to new zealand i was never really aware of a, a sound committed to an area i obviously knew Manchester, but there was a thing called the dunedin sound which is a particular part of new zealand a city my bunged up nose didn't do that right. The Dun Dundeden sound. Dunedin sound. Dunedin sound. There we go. So uh, there was a band formed in 1978 in Dunedin. D-U-N-E-D-I-N. -E there we go. There's a silent D that's very visible, <laughs> if that makes sense. There's a Flying Nun label. Uh, they were the band that encompassed that sound when I play it, you'll you'll hear it and go, oh, I've heard that kind of sound. But they were the people who who started it, sort sort of, sort of jingly, sort of jangly, sort of reverby, but not in the way the birds and that sound did it. Yola Tengo uh, were massively influenced by them. They did a cover of one of the other songs by The Clean, but the guy Peter Gutteridge, Gutteridge, who died at the age of fifty three in two thousand and fourteen with a song called Point That Thing Somewhere Else by a band he was in called The Clean. And then we're going to finish with, and you won't be hearing my voice at the end of it, with a guy called Red Foley, who died at the age of 58 in 1968. He was massively involved with American country music after World War II being what we'll call modernised, even though what he did is now probably considered old-style country music. He was one of the biggest stars one of the first million selling records, even though it'd be technically be more gospel, was called uh, Peace in the Valley, which is what we're going to finish with. He also joined the Grand Ole Opry and he remained in it till he died. The song we're going to hear is the very last song he played in his life. He played with a Grand Ole Opry performance in Fort Wayne in India, Indiana, sorry on the 29th of September, 1968. And he sung the song Peace in the Valley along with Hank Williams Jr. He was like, you know, the way the Opry worked, everyone sort of backed each other and stuff. And Red Foley had sung this song at Hank Williams Sr. or Hank Williams' funeral. So there's an incredible little connection there. Both Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis covered a lot of his songs. They said he was an inspiration to their style, which was an inspiration to rock and roll. I, I think this is the third time I'm referring to the Beatles, talking about people who influenced the Beatles and the people who influenced those people. And finally, he was also the host of the first country music TV show on American TV. So it was called Ozark Jubilee. But anyway, OK, Peter Goodridge and the clean would point that thing somewhere else and then wrote Red Foley with Peace in the Valley. Thanks very much for listening. It's been a long one. And we'll see each other again, I hope. Bye. <laughs>
tired and so weary But I must go along Till the Lord will come and call Call me away, oh yes Well, the morning so bright And the Lamb is the light And the night, night is as black as the sea Oh yeah There will be peace in the valley for me someday There will be peace in the valley for me Oh Lord I pray There will be no sadness no sorrow my Lord, no trouble I see. There will be peace in the valley for me. Changed, changed from this creature that I am, oh yeah. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me, oh Lord, I pray. No sadness, no sorrow, oh my Lord, no trouble I see. There will be peace in the valley for me.